week three of the course. We're getting there, slowly but surely. Last week, we looked at Du Fu and the An Lu Shan Rebellion. This week, we are staying in China, but moving significantly further forward into the 20th century. We'll be looking at the poetry of Meng He, uh, who was representative of kind of a school of poets, but mostly just a collection of poets, the quote-unquote misty poets. Misty is a uh, sort of a derisive title given them by some of the press at the time because their poetry appeared so just utterly bizarre, consciously bizarre. Meng He came out of the Cultural Revolution. He and his friends, his colleagues... And a lot of his poems deal with the aftermath of that. But before we can get into specifically why his poetry is so interesting and evocative, we have to get into a little bit of the Cultural Revolution. And for that, we have to know about the legacy of Mao Zedong in China. That's a massive topic. The lecture you're about to see is meant to be very concise, very short. You will see a lot more words on my PowerPoint slides than I'm actually going to say. You can read those later if you want. I'm giving you the briefest thumbnail sketch of a very complex issue. But the poetry that follows the Cultural Revolution, and for that matter, most of the writing that follows it in general into the 90s and, and aughts, deals with the legacy of Mao Zedong himself, not just the political events that surrounded him, but the man. Uh, we're going to be looking at why his legacy is so problematic and why his downfall is sort of representative of a sort of general literary struggle, an identity struggle for most of the rest of the history that follows him. So, what is the deal with Mao Zedong? If you've studied any world history, you know that Mao is one of the most important figures of the 20th century. Like him or hate him, and there's no middle ground here. I lived in China for almost 10 years, or have lived. I'd like to live there again. And you meet opposing parties. Uh, my friends and colleagues, when I was a master's degree student at Nankai University, almost universally loathed him, hated him. Uh, and we'll see why in a little bit, but I met tons of other people who thought he was a great hero. What is interesting is that those calling him a great hero always zero in on two things, right? And we're going to talk about those two things very quickly today and why all of this matters in the context of poetry, specifically poetry about one political event that, depending on your reading, Mao drove forward and instituted in the first place. So all you really need to know to start with is that by the 1920s, when communism was really coming into its own in China, the country was run by warlords. Nominally, it was a republic and had been since 1911, but really the guys with guns ran it. And they really didn't like communists. And they started killing them, as many as they could get their hands on. Mao, with the rest of the supporters he could drum up, 100,000 in all, fled from southeastern China all the way up here, way deep in the hinterlands out in Shenxi province, right? This is a march of over 5,600 miles. March, not drive. They didn't have trucks. They didn't have North Face gear. They didn't have really much anything. They had cloth shoes, denim coats. Most people died. It took them over a year to walk there. 8,000 out of 100,000 arrived there. Now, not all of those 100,000 died. Some of them just peeled off and quit, which you can imagine, right? But the ones that made it were the hardcore. You can imagine this, right? If, if Bernie Sanders today said, you know what, we're in trouble, so we're going to set up shop. Uh, we're, we're starting here in Boston, but really where we're going is Alaska. And take all his supporters, 100,000 and all, and they walk all the way through southern Canada and over the mountains and over the worst terrain you could think of to, to Alaska. And only a fraction of the people who started actually make it there. The ones who do make it there are hardcore, right? This is the hardcore center of the movement. This is really where Mao's romantic image starts. And in this sense, it is well-earned. Regardless of what you think about communism, leading a march of over 5,000 miles over a year 
and still keeping the movement going is some serious commitment. Um, now, this is where Mao starts writing about Marxism on his own, as his own sort of theoretician. And he is somewhat novel in his approach. He, for example, believes that the peasantry, the farmers, are the people who should be driving this forward, as opposed to the industrial laborer, which was the core of regular Marxism. Lenin, Marx, Stalin all wrote about the industrial working class. The farmer was meant to sort of come up afterwards. Mao goes in reverse, largely because by the time he got to Yan'an, which is the, the spot in, in Shanxi where he settled, that's the people he had to work with. Um, sorry, I'm jumping around in this PowerPoint because it's a much longer lecture that I'm trying to taper down to a, a more manageable length. Now, the other thing that makes Mao a romantic figure after this great march is the fact that he's really the only one left after the Japanese overthrow the nationalists in the 1930s who's willing to fight the Japanese. Partly because, I mean, you're that far out, even the Japanese military, who throughout most of the early 20th century used any pretext available to carve out parts of China for themselves, usually brutally and inhumanely, even they are looking at Yan'an and going, yeah, it's not really worth the effort to go all the way out there, right? Now, this leads to a what-if question. The U.S. at the time was cooperating with the head of the Republican government, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, Jiang Jiexi in the uh, Chinese. Except Chiang didn't want to fight the Japanese. He wanted to fight the communists, and he was stockpiling U.S. weapons because he thought, look, the Americans are going to eventually beat the Japanese, and when they do, i got to get rid of the communists somehow, and this is what I'm going to do. The American commander at the time, General Joseph Stilwell, who was working with the Chinese military, hated Chiang Kai-shek and wanted to fight with Mao, uh, which didn't, of course, work. But it's an interesting thing to think about. How would U.S.-China relations have been if he had? Okay. World War II comes to a close. There is a bloody civil war that ends in 1949. And after that, Mao and the communists are the victors. Now, if the story ended here... What would be your impressions of Mao Zedong? If you're in China today and you ask most people about Mao, if they say he's a hero, they're going to point to these two things. I had a student come to my office once when I was a teacher and we were talking about just stuff, just history and stuff. And he was telling me the official party line on the post-war period, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And that is that Mao had some mistakes, but for the most part, he was he was on the right track. And I said, well, hypothetically, let's just say that my version of your history, or the, the my version, it's not my personal history, but history written by non-Chinese state elements is correct. Let's say that's correct. And Mao was actually the one behind all of the purges and bloodshed that followed. Would he still be a hero? And my student said, of course. And I said, interesting. Well, Why? And his answer was because Mao got rid of the Japanese. Now, historically, of course, Mao didn't really get rid of the Japanese, but it's undeniable that he fought the Japanese. And for anyone considering Mao a hero, you cannot erase the long march, it's called, to Yan'an and fighting the Japanese because this is the Mao that is the popular figure, right? The, that the Mao that leads an absolutely superhuman march across nasty terrain and then still with no real support fights an overwhelmingly superior force for years at a time and then takes control of the country. That's quite a romantic figure, right? But as we're going to see in a second, that doesn't last very long. Again, rather than give you the complete history of Maoist China, I am going to have to leapfrog some fairly significant things. What you need to know about Mao for now is that his approach to Marxism said that if basically the people want it bad enough, you can have socialism in one generation. Now, if you haven't studied anything to do with socialism or communism, your fingernail sketch is that socialism and communism are not the same thing. Communism is meant to be the ideal end of socialism. Socialism is where the government or a larger party sort of administers goods on behalf of workers and everyone is supposed to get an equal share, etc. Communism is meant to be what happens when all the means of production are eventually turned over to the workers themselves. So if you work at a factory, 
That means you get to take whatever you make from that factory, trade or sell it, usually trade it in, in the sort of communist ideal, to others who are also laboring on behalf of themselves. That's the goal. So if you hear a giant government described as communist, that's impossible. Communism is something governed by communes, right? Not a government, a huge government particularly. Now, in the traditional sense, Marx, Lenin, Stalin, and others, and many, many others, believed that you couldn't simply just say, now we're going to have socialism. It was going to take a long time. For Lenin, that was a period of continuous revolution. For Mao, on the other hand, he believed that if the people simply had enough revolutionary fervor, you could have socialism in a generation. His first major mistake was in 1950, insisting that China could become a modern industrial working force, a modern industrial nation, in five years. The resulting tragedy had farmers all over the country trying to produce steel, industrial steel, not farming for themselves, not feeding themselves, and eventually leading to mass deaths, up to 50 million. That's probably a little much in terms of the estimated death toll, but it's undeniable that many, many, many people during this period died, and almost entirely due to government mismanagement. Now, Mao was made to step down after this. You can kind of imagine why. Even the most diehards have to look at this kind of death toll and go, maybe this is not working. But Mao wasn't done. Later that year, that year was 62, or 66, rather, Mao stages a photo op, basically, where he swims across the Yangtze River. He's 72 years old. This is not an insignificant swim. It's a way of basically telling people, look, I've still got it. And his answer to the problems of the country is that the Communist Party itself has been infiltrated by non-communist elements. And the way we're going to fix that is by turning loose the young people on the four olds. Old customs, old culture, old habits, old ideas. What exactly are those? Well, no one really says for certain, right? But the idea is that the young people, and you can see from this poster, right? Mostly young people, very strong young people. They're going to know, right? Young people are going to know it when they see it because they're the true spirit of the Communist Party. And he exhorts them to get rid of these elements and get rid of those people who practice them. This is why it is called the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. The revolution is getting rid of the old culture. It is brutal. You can imagine why and how it would be. You have millions, or at least a million anyway, younger people told to get rid of everything they consider to be a part of the four olds. Their leaders are only a few years older than them. Teachers, professories, professors, factory owners, anyone accused of being a counter-revolutionary is forced into a struggle session where they are forced to denounce their crimes and frequently beaten. Everyone carries with them the little red book of Mao's sayings and quotations. You can still buy these in China. Um, simply in August and September, almost 1,800 people were murdered in Beijing alone. Cultural sites, like the burial place of Confucius, were desecrated and destroyed. Libraries ransacked. Books burned. The death toll mounts. Now, in 1968, even Mao looks at the carnage and says, this is probably not working the way it's supposed to be, but you can't just switch off that much passion, that much fervor, misguided though it might be. And so he institutes the Down to the Countryside movement, where basically all the people who are behind this are sent out to the countryside to teach and learn from the peasants in the remotest parts of the country who are, of course, the purest representatives of the Chinese communist ideal. And this movement lasts for the next 10 years. During those 10 years, effectively schools don't exist. Universities don't exist. And so a lot of these people that are this age, like you see in the picture, once all of this is over, will be looking around without really any education. I will leapfrog a lot of what brings this whole conflict to a close. It is intra-party fighting with Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, and her quote-unquote gang of four. Actually, it would have been three others. She would have been a part of the gang of four. 
sort of holding the line that no, see, the problem is that we're not serious enough, right? More has to happen in order to really push socialism through in its, in its pure essence. And then there are opposing elements, like this guy in the background, Deng Xiaoping, who was purged from the party during this period twice and sent off to labor in exile, and then, of course, comes back as the leader after 1976. Deng, and for that matter, uh, Mao's other, not successor, but definitely right-hand man, Zhou Enlai, advocated a much more moderate approach. And we could get technical about it, but basically it boiled down to this. Yeah, socialism is great. We should definitely be doing it. We're in, but we're totally broke, 100% broke. And unless we actually have a functioning economy, none of this is really going to work. So after 1976, when Mao dies and the Cultural Revolution is officially over and Mao's wife has been tried uh, and incidentally blamed for the whole thing, the official line today is that Mao was simply advocating a more modest uh, reform of the party and his wife is the one who drove the bus into the ditch. Historically, that's not particularly accurate, but that's the that's the official narrative right now in China. Um, does everyone believe it? No, not everyone believes it, but that's the official narrative. Anyway, Deng takes over, and over the course of the next decade, along with the party, reverses every policy decision made during the Cultural Revolution. Now, that would be enough to understand where Mangke's poetry is coming from, but I'm going to suggest that there is something about Mao Zedong that goes a little deeper than simply the Cultural Revolution that he helped to start. And the answer, in interestingly enough, is his poetry. Mao was a longtime poet, loved poetry, wrote it constantly. Um, and we're going to look at one now that will, I think, help shed some light on a very typical modern Chinese political struggle. There are a lot of poems we could probably choose. I am choosing possibly the most dramatic because it's the last he ever wrote, or at least the last that we know of, that he wrote in 1975. The English translation reads this way. Loyal and steadfast towards the country and its troubles, did I ever fear to face execution? Now all under heaven is red, and on whom does the nation depend for its defense? The task is still not complete, the body is weary, the hair is autumnal. This generation of yours and mine, will it endure to see its wish fulfill, fulfilled, or will it lose it irrevocably? This does not sound like the poem of someone who has led a successful revolution and a 5,000-mile march and several decades of leadership. This sounds like someone who believes he's on the verge of failure. This is also something written in a very mixed style. Um, you can see from the Chinese here different line lengths. Okay, Now these first two lines have each of them different numbers of characters. Right, This one has seven, followed by five. This one has six, followed by five. Very irregular. That's a very modern convention. By the time Mao was writing, there were already several decades of poets in China writing in a very sort of uh, looser, free style that the West was using as well. But then we have the final two lines. Three, 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 four, four, four. Very, very, very regular, classical form of writing. And the lines rhyme. Qiu and Liu are rhyming characters. They are not nearly as rigorous as these lines aren't as a classical poem, but they are calling back to it. The other thing calling back to the classical idiom is this little bit here. The hair is autumnal. You should remember when we read Du Fu, the poem Spring Scene, in which the, poem is, the poet is lamenting someone, possibly his own, their hair being too thin to hold a hat pin. In the middle of the An Lushan tragedy, someone is worrying about their hair. Here, too, someone is commenting on their, his hair. The Mao is commenting on his hair. Perhaps consciously calling back to Du Fu, and he very clearly read classical poetry, even though for most of his life he sought to sort of overturn anything that smacked of older China. He still understood and read this classical poetry. And this is where we get a lot of the more interesting aspects of Mao's life and character. This is not someone 
even as committed a communist as he was, there is still this lingering fascination with the classical. This lingering question, are we really doing what we should be doing? Not should as in morally, but should as in practically, politically. Is this working? Um, Manka and the poets who come after, now after him with him are coming out of an era that is defined, I would argue, by this experience here. Questioning where they're going, but also questioning who we are, right? Is this the China that we are? Modern China with its write-whatever-you-want poetry? Or are we the classical China with its regular and rhymed lines? Are we still the people that Du Fu helped create? Or are we something that's different, right? There's this collision of the two. And throughout his life, Mao never really resolved this. Marxism was a non-Chinese thought system that was imported into China. So it was never fully Chinese, no matter how much Mao tried to make it that way. Um, In effect, his failures stemmed from his trying to behave like an emperor and you could argue a lot of the failures of major socialist governments were the same, rather than simply a chairman. Some of his compatriots, like Zhou Enlai and Deng Xiaoping, who we saw, behaved a little differently. But Mao was a poet. Mao was someone who read Du Fu. Mao was someone who could write, at least somewhat like Du Fu. The opinions are mixed about how good this poetry actually was. But he still understood that the world they lived in was not Du Fu's world, but a more modern world. So as we move into a discussion of Meng Ke's poetry in particular, try to keep this conflict in mind. Meng Ke and his fellow poets like Bei Dao are coming out of an era of profound disillusionment, not only by those who suffered through the Cultural Revolution, but those who perpetrated it. And it's not simply a conflict between how best to be communist. It's a conflict over who are we as a people. Are we people who write Dufu-style poetry? Are we people who can write whatever we want? Manka and his compatriots read a lot of T.S. Eliot. We'll get into why that's interesting here in a little while. And other Western poets who had themselves read Chinese poetry. And they're saying, look, to be Chinese is, is just something different. We can define ourselves however we want, even if that's contrary to everything we used to read and know. Mao is someone who was never really sure. Someone who liked to believe that being Marxist was an international universal thing that bound all sort of uh, proletariat together. But he was still writing classical verse because there was still a part of him that believed, no, no, we're different. We are different. China is different. For Monk and the others, this is also... Not a struggle the way it was for Mao, but there is still this conflict. Do we simply jettison everything? Do we make something new? Does making something new also point back to something old? The lingering influence and the legacy of the classical poetry is always with them, even when they're writing something that sounds totally opposed to it. 